right, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, Linda Henry, probably everyone knows here, but I will remind you of the many things that she does here and for the city. She's managing director uh, of the Boston Globe. She's a minority owner of the Boston Red Sox, and I think is still director of the Red Sox Foundation? Yep. Okay. Uh, Co-founder of Hub Week, which is the collaboration among the Globe, Harvard, MIT, and Mass General. They have events, they have an annual festival that explores the future at the intersection of art, science, and technology. She's a co-founder of the Boston Public Market, which is an indoor marketplace for local artisanal farmers. She created Globe Docs at the Globe, which does monthly screenings of documentary films and an annual documentary film festival, and a lot more. So, she is exactly the person we want here for the, for the topic, how can a company enhance a community? So I think in this discussion we want to talk about uh, the companies she works for, some of the other projects she works for, and talk about how they intersect or how they could intersect with Boston's development. So just before we start, I want to—I pulled out a quote I did research oh. in a Boston magazine <laughs> profile of you, which you probably hate because no one <laughs> likes profiles of them. But there was a quote from your husband John, who I think it was a discussion about Hub Week, and he, he was talking to somebody. He said, "That's exactly what my wife wants to do: make Boston big in the world." Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to come back to that theme in a second. So. But let's start with the globe. Um, it seems to me the best thing that globe leadership can do for this community is keep it alive. You know, keep, keep the globe a, a vibrant sort of scrappy newspaper. So it's partly about survival, but it, it's about more than that. I'd love to hear, you know, where you are in the kind of the turnaround effort you're on uh, with this great institution. Great, well, thank you. Thanks for hosting this conversation and thank you all for for being here today. This is my first time with this conference and it's, can you guys hear me? The acoustics in here are weird, but um, it's my first time with this conference, but it's just really great to see so many people across so many different industries in Boston gathering together to learn and think um, and find ways that we can all do better at what we do. So thank you for having me. And in terms of the Boston Globe, um, I have been at the Globe now for almost six years and it has been a remarkable journey. Uh, with a lot of ups and downs. And what is great is that right now, you know, we came in with this concept that we are stewards and that we have to do what we can um, to have a strong, vibrant newspaper that can serve our city. And that in order to have a strong city, if you look at sort of, if I were to take a step back and say, you know, what, what is the work that's been important to me is to have a strong, vibrant city where more people can live, work, and thrive. And a key ingredient for that is a really strong, effective newspaper. And um, six years in, when we joined, um, the New York Times had uh, owned the Globe for 20 years. And while they had maintained a really great standard of journalism, there had been not a lot of investment in the long-term growth and sort of preparing the globe for the current news environment. And so we had to invest corner by corner. And we did a lot of really, really hard things. Um, but we found the right people and the right leadership group to really take it to a place where we are finally, for the first time in a long time, in the black. And what that means for us is that it just gives us this base of um, sustainability and stability that we can really go and focus on our mission instead of focusing on on as much on just how are we going to get this organization forward, it's okay, our organization is where it needs to be right now, and we can really focus more and dig more into how do we better serve our region. So let me push you on the little, that yes. a little bit. So, so what is it that a big city daily is supposed to do now? I mean, what does it readers expect from you, and what is it that you can do better than anybody else? Well, <clears throat> we're the largest newsroom in New England, and um, there's a, it's a balance between um, the, here are the notes from the school committee meeting, and here's what you need to know. Here are the interesting stories that you need to know. And so we really shifted our priorities from here's a minutia to here's the bigger um, stories. And we still have a large investigative team, our spotlight team, that's going sort of deeper into those big issues. And we're covering, we have a, D, we have a DC bureau, we have a bureau in the state house, we have a bureau in city hall. So we're covering that stuff as well, as well as the deeper dives into education and marijuana is one of our new beats. Are you micless? I think you might be. You, you, you keep talking. It's just, uh -huh. ah. Right, Wait, sorry. you can pin it to this one. All right. Okay. I'll lean. Okay. Um, 
So, okay, so I'm interested then in what, so as you look at the success of the globe, what are the metrics you care about? Is it circulation? Is it subscribers? Is it profitability? Is so it the else? first one is, you know, when you are, so the goal for the few years has been, been a number of things, but one is to get our arms around what, what's been going on and, um, and get it into the black, uh, meaning that we are not bleeding cash anymore. And that is just a wonderful place for any company uh, to be in. And um, so from there, we look at our revenue going forward. There are certain systemic industry-wide declines that you are brilliantly immune from, uh, such as um, uh, you know advertising declines and um, just sort of a, a changing newspaper dynamics. But we've been really focusing on our subscribers and on consumer revenue. And so that's been, for us, the most important metric yeah. going forward. Now, I mean, newspapers, people have, um, you know, maybe an unrealistic expectation or, or have, a, have an outsized relationship with actually a couple of the institutions that you work with, but let's, let's keep with the globe, which is, you know, it's a symbol of a city and, and maybe people grew up reading it and want it to help heal the wounds of the city and promote good things. And I, I guess to, to what extent is that, do you accept that? Or to what extent is that unfair because you are, as you say, you're trying to run a business and, you know, get it in the black. And um, I, I guess maybe the question is to what extent can you, do you do things that are for the community because of your, your beliefs or the desire of your readers versus the commercial imperatives? That's a, that's a really interesting question. So the way our philosophy is that we are stewards, you know, the, we have a, like I said, we have a great leadership team that's there right now that's looking at, you know, it's, it's not about making money, it's about having a sustainable business. And, and there, so there are decisions we make to do that, but our first and foremost, our belief is that, with our focus on subscribers, is that we need to serve our readers first. And if we do that, and we do that well, and we continue to provide the critical information that they need to live, work, and thrive in this city, then sort of everything else will work out. So I would say our, the balance is, is taking care of our readers, making sure that we have the best journalism in town, um, and covering the issues that need to be covered. Um, and so as, as stewards, that's what we look for. Yeah, and obviously you're a subscription business. That's yes. what it's all about. How, you know, how's that going? I mean, I, you probably don't make a lot of this stuff public, you don't need to, but yep. but I assume digital subscriptions is probably the, the... Yeah, we are doing really well. Again, we we believe that we have content that's worth paying for, and it, our content is really expensive to produce. And so we charge subscription for it, and we have to. We have a free website, boston.com, that serves our community and provides information that you need to know. But the deeper stuff that the investigative work, the deep... Uh, the deeper dives, the you know the extensive coverage. That's the expensive journalism that's on, on the globe. And wait, what was the question? Well, just um, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have? It was a good question? one. Yeah. No. Um, but but what uh, uh, you know, what can you say about the development of the subscription business? Oh, oh right. The subscription you're business. Up digital. So we've been really um, from we have more total subscribers now than we had six years ago. Uh, when when we joined, and um, that's so, because so presumably print print and is going digital. down, but digital is print has up. gone down, but our digital is really strong. We have the second largest digital only subscriber base, second only for a metro paper, um, second only to the LA Times, which is a slightly larger metro right. area than us. But we've been really um, pushing it. We've been uh, investing heavily in our digital offerings in terms of we have a whole new. Um, interface, a whole new website, a whole new CMS, all of that. We've been, again, we've been just investing in every corner so that we can provide a, a really valuable and um, impactful product for years to come. Yeah. I think I just got an offer today, 26 weeks of the Boston Globe. Yeah. For a dollar? That's because you're not a subscriber. Well, I am, but <laughs> I am, but not in that particular avenue. Where not I in that avenue. To it, yeah. So one of the things that we have a culture of, and we've been really, it's been really important at the Globe to have this 
culture of entrepreneurial, you know, this ethos of just trying. We're trying a lot of things. And so we have a lot of data on what makes people subscribe and sort of how long it takes. And so we'll, we've been working, we partner with MIT, we partner, we bring in data scientists and look at our data and say, oh, you know what? If we run a one day sale, we'll have this many people sign on and we expect this percentage will drop off at the end of the sale, but the overall number that we'll have at the end of that will be larger than if we do our regular pricing. And so we try. Mm -hmm. We try playing with our paywall and whatnot, but that's really important in an old institution like the Boston Globe to really encourage and promote this idea that we can try and we can fail, but we're gonna learn and we're gonna keep learning and iterating. Yeah, actually, can you talk a little more about what you've sort of learned and, I don't know, missteps along the way and, because and, it's, you know, oh, probably I don't the think sixth we have time. We years. only have a half an hour. So uh, we, uh, w there have been a lot of um, mistakes that we've made. As with any, any company, um, you know, we have had experience in a lot of areas and uh, in a lot of different businesses, a lot of different industries, but there is a feeling in newspapers, and I think that a lot of companies in industries feel like, well, there's nothing else really like this. There's nothing else like um, insurance or there's nothing else like newspapers. And so um, I would say one of, the, one of the many mistakes that we made is that when we really felt that we had to have people who had been in the industry for 30 years and we relied on their expertise, um, and they were smart and they were well-intentioned and they you know, had the business at heart, but the industry had changed. And we knew that it had changed, but we deferred to people who had more of this very specific industry experience. And it wasn't really until we stopped doing that. And our leadership team today is almost entirely people who have never worked in newspapers before that we were able to really get this momentum to this stability uh, where we are today. And are they? I don't know, I wouldn't recommend that for every, <laughs> right. for every company, but for us it was, it was just this departure from how the industry used to be, which is, yeah. which is only somewhat relevant to how it is today. And, and are the new people, are they data and analytics people? Is that kind of? Some of them, I mean everything from HR to legal to our CEO to our CFO um, to our sales, um, none of them have worked in a newspaper before. Yeah. Um, so you talked about our editor has worked in the newspaper. Yeah, that, that's important. Um, so you talked about how some of these marketing approaches, paywall, can move the needle. But what about content? You know, what moves the needle? Whether it's in terms of more people picking up the print edition that day, or a spike in in you know in, in signups, registration, circulation. You know, is there something that content-wise that can is that? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, and, and we are, we've been investing in new data analytics software uh, as well to help us understand that, and they all have fancy names. This one's called Sophie, but we are, um, one of the best things is to have really compelling content. So if there's a really great story that's, you know, we had a, an amazing uh, deep investigation, we call it the Valedictorian Project, where we looked at um, the valedictorians for the past few years from Boston's public schools and we followed them and saw where they were today. And it was a real, it was a deep dive and it was an important piece that gets into equity and sort of how our schools are doing and that is something that it was an important piece for us and it also really resonated with readers and for us, again, where our goal is sustainability for us as a business, but that sparked conversations across the city. There were over 70 events that this piece, the valedictorian project, um, inspired because it, may, it was this, well, here's this evidence of this inequity that's going on in our school systems and what can we do about it? And that's the sort of a reporting that we want to be able to do. Those stories don't come out every day. Um, we, you know, we did a deep dive into Aaron Hernandez. We turned it into a podcast. Yeah, and, with Wondery. Mm -hmm. uh, with Wondery. And, and so again, we're finding new ways. We're, we're just continuing to find new ways. We launched a whole vertical on marijuana um, and we are expanding. We have a whole vertical in Rhode Island. So we keep growing and trying. We did a vertical on uh, Catholic news. Tur that didn't work out well. We learned from it. We figured things out. We launched another one on um, life sciences with stat news. So 
we, it's been really important to us that we create this culture of it's okay to try and, and see what works. And if it doesn't work, learn from it and move on, keep going. So I have one question, I'm not gonna yes. ask you about labor talks, but, but, but just one question, I, probably everyone here is thinking about the workplace of the future. Yep. I know I'm thinking about the workplace of the future. And that's, you know, that's a world of more automation, of, of AI, working with humans, of, you know, you've already, I yep. think your workforce is, has declined already. You know, you're, you're in a, a partly unionized um, yep. shop, obviously. How do you, you know, without, I'm not gonna press you on yep. any details because it's not the place for that, but, but how do you think about you know, the kind of dramatic transformation that's, that's ahead of you with a traditional kind of labor structure that um, is not gonna easily go from one to the other. So there's a really exciting project that, this is a really good point, because again, this fills, fill, fits in with this culture that we've been really stressing of, of trying and innovating. And so we have a, an amazing AI project that we're launching now where it's not something that uh, will replace journalists, but we call it like we call it an Iron Man suit for our journalists, where they can go in and just have an incredible amount of data at their fingerprint at their fingertips. So, we're of the belief that we're not replacing journalists, but we can make them a lot more impactful, and we can make them a lot more efficient if we're able to. So, for example, with the U.S. presidential election, we've developed. We're partnering with Google, and we're creating this. Um, system and this database and this AI system that transcribes all of their speeches, all of the candidates' speeches, and all of their dates and all of their schedule. And so we can now analyze if a candidate is speaking differently for one particular crowd versus another. We can look at who donated to Hillary Clinton versus who donated to Bernie Sanders in this election round. And so for us, AI is incredibly important. It's something that we as a newspaper are, are investing in. But the goal, again, being to create this awesome Iron Man suit where you can just process and do a lot more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about the Red Sox. Sure. So you are, you are an owner. If you watched all six hours last night, I'm amazed. I saw a lot of it. <laughs> I, I had a friend in San Francisco, we were actually texting each other saying, this is not very good baseball no, being played. No, no. Um, but I, I'd love to get a sense, you know, what is it like to to own an institution that, again, is so em emblematic of the city that people think they own a part of. Yep. They probably come up to you and, and give you advice on what you should do with the team. Yep. Oh, by the way, I actually have some thoughts on the, bull I would the bullpen. I would love to hear it. No, I, I think really, I figured out the bullpen. We'll, okay, we'll talk, okay, we'll good, talk thank later. you. No, but I, I really, I mean, no one's in this role, or very few people are in a role like this. What is yep. it like, you know, to, to be, you used the word steward before, but for an institution that people have here, even more in the globe, such an emotional attachment to. I, it's it's the same feeling. It's the same feeling where the Red Sox and the Globe existed for a long time before, and it's going to exist for a long time after. And it's our incredible honor and opportunity and challenge to do the best that we can with both of them, and with the with Liv the same attitude towards Liverpool. And Liverpool fans will make it very clear that you are temporary. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the same, it's a, it's a very similar feeling. And people have just the same amount of, of um, passion and interest in terms of what you're covering in your paper and whether that's appropriate for the Boston Globe. And, and it's wonderful for people to feel that sort of connection and ownership um, and part of it because it is. It is something that's much bigger than than any of us. It's something that you know you have an opportunity to identify with and feel part of, and it's our job to just make it as good and efficient and successful, and and let that be. So let's talk about the definition of success then. Yes. So you know, is it's success very it's very clear in baseball. <laughs> well, okay. So victories, but if you're the owner, is success bottom line? Is success attendance? And what that says about the future engagement yep. of, let's say, a younger cohort and even being interested in the sport. I mean, how, how, when you, success can't, I, I imagine success isn't just the win-loss yep. record, maybe it is. Well, it's, it's interesting because there's, there's with, the, with both the Globe and the Red Sox, there's an opportunity to leverage the passion that people have for it to do so much more. And so the Boston Red Sox, for example, has the largest team charity in all of sports. And that's right here in Boston, and that's because there's such 
a smart and passionate and engaged fan base and that we're able to harness that for good. And for, um, you know, same thing for the Red Sox, for the Globe where we can harness this passion and interest and care that people have for this city and talk about issues that really matter. Um, and for, in terms of what does success mean, it means a lot of different things. So in the Red Sox, there's obviously the big trophy mm -hmm. at the end. And um, I think you and I were talking a little bit earlier about there are parallels between business and sports, and then there are some non-parallels that you don't get a trophy. Oh, well, I guess in, in journalism, you get- We give ourselves a lot of awards. We give ourselves <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we really like giving ourselves awards. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there is a tendency. You know, I started, I created a television show to use um, baseball to teach kids STEM. Mm -hmm. You know, so thinking about the future generations and, you know, capturing the passion for baseball to use it to teach math, the attendance at, at games, the, you know, how much are people watching? What are the ratings on Nessun? Those are all things that, that we look at as well. Um, and knowing that we're in a town, I'm, uh, we're talking, I'm tomorrow I'm interviewing um, the, the owner of the Cincinnati Reds, and it's a great fan base, but the expectation here is a little bit different. The expectation here is that we put out a team that's gonna win. Yeah. And in order to do that, you have to have the resources to, to field that team, right? So for us, that goes into the attendance, into the ratings and yeah. whatnot, so that we can put in for a, a small market to have the biggest payroll is, yeah. says something about our fan base. Well, so attendance peaked, if I remember it right, in 2009, I think, mm -hmm. for the Red Sox. I think it peaked for Major League Baseball overall two years before that. It's not bad, no. but, but it's, it's not growing. You know, it's, 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 it's come down a little bit, maybe stabilizing. What do, what do owners of professional baseball teams think about that? I mean, I hear sportscasters say, oh, the game needs to change in this way and that way, and younger people aren't interested, and this is a problem. Does it, does it look like a problem from where you sit? So it, it depends on what you look at. There are more people, more kids are playing baseball now than they have in years. So that number of kids playing baseball is, is, is going up. Yeah, okay. I don't have, I don't remember the exact number. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for this question. But uh, you know, the number um, of kids playing baseball is going up, and that's something we look at. You know, the number we look at the ratings, and the ratings are still are still strong. And yes, there are some games on. So there are committees within which I am not part of, but there are committees um, within baseball that are looking at the pace of the game and the competitiveness and the structure and it's a balance you know some leagues in in the NFL they change the rules every year mm -hmm. and there are small changes have a take a little bit longer but there are pitch clocks there's um, automatic calls of balls and strikes there's a lot of things that are that are experimenting the being, minor leagues yeah. yep yep um, so okay so then the metric about wins and losses I have to ask this question which yes. is so the Red Sox since 2004 have had just unmatched success, you know, four, four world championships. But there's this weird boom and bust cycle sometimes. <laughs> and I, I, think it was, I think it was 2012 was the best example, last place to first place and then last place again. Yeah. What, what's going on there? You know, I, if we look at the Patriots uh, yeah. with, with great admiration of, of how hard it is, it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird thing. And it's, it's something that, you know, in, in some senses, and again, I'm not the best person to talk about this with, but as, as, um, as an active observer, you can say that it's, there's something about going really hard deep into October and the recovery from there and sort of what, you know, I think that there's a lot of, of recovery. I think that there's a lot of psychological things. There's a different hunger um, in mm -hmm. the beginning. You know, when you're playing for something bigger than yourself, uh, mm -hmm. there's a sort of mission that you're playing for, and sometimes it's hard to maintain that after you win, but some teams are able to do it, and that's not something that we figured out that formula. Yeah. So and sometimes you think that just because it worked the year before, again, yeah. we have essentially the same team, but that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean. That would be my takeaway, that you, you can't assume yeah. you did it once, you just keep it all intact and you'll do it again. You need to, that's kind of what you maybe experienced at the Globe, you need to kind of refresh. You the, need to refresh. Um, so so it, it seemed like the Red Sox truly caught old fashioned family magic. At, there, there was a, I don't know if people are baseball fans here, but there was a game that the Red Sox played against Kansas City that they finally had to stop because it was raining <laughs> and it was late. 
So they decided to restart it, I don't know, two weeks later or yep. something. So it was going to be an off day, but it was a day game. I think it was a dollar for kids to get in, five dollars for adults. Kids' food was a dollar. They let children run around the bases afterwards. It was, so I wasn't there, but even watching on TV, you, could, you just felt, this is a great, it felt like, okay, you've suddenly solved all the problems that people talk <laughs> about, about baseball. You had, you did, something amazing was happening. And it, was that just a, a one-off fluke, or, or can you learn from that um, um. and adopt any of that? I think, so I want to, just to the previous comment, I want to say, reassure everybody that I have nothing to do with baseball ops. That is a great reassurance there that I have no influence or say so in who's on the field. And that's, that's I want to make that very clear. Um, but in terms of that, um, the, we, I talked about the culture of the globe being one that's, that's willing to try. And, and the other culture of the globe aspect is, which was different than what I anticipated, but change is a constant. There is a constant, um, understanding that the world is changing and the newspaper has to change as well, which is different than what I expected. The culture of the Red Sox is just amazing because it, it's a yes culture. They find a way to get to yes and they find a way to do different things. We have the second oldest ballpark and we have a farm. We have bike ballet. We have football games there. We do, we put in a crazy ski jump. We just find ways to do things with what we have. And that was just a great opportunity. So we have, um, yes, we, we do a lot to engage kids throughout games. We have a whole kids' playroom. We have um, children's programming. There's a whole animated special that I created about um, opening day that's meant to engage kids. We have um, $10 kids tickets for every game. So there's a lot. That one was just an opportunity where we could go deep and, mm -hmm. and really get back to the basics of, en of yeah. engaging kids. Yeah, it was nice. Um, Okay, so getting back to the topic of, of making Boston big. Yes. Okay, so you uh, helped create Hub Week. Yes. Five years ago. Yes. So this, probably most people know this, but it's, uh, um, I guess now it's more of an ongoing uh, dialogue event series, but, but with a, an annual, you know, several days, big festival, idea yep. festival. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you had and have big ambitions for what that can be. Can you talk a little bit about you know, what, what you hope Hub Week could do for Boston and to what extent you've gotten there or you've shifted courses to try to, try to get there? Great. Um, so Hub Week is, this, is an idea, right? It, this idea that collaboratively, it, it, that collectively we can tell the story of Boston. And um, it is, you know, we believe that the future, of being of, uh, the future is being built here in Boston and it's at the intersection of art, science, and technology and that we as a region are competing every day. We're competing with other cities for talent, for investment, for companies, for resources, for grants. And telling that story is an incredibly important thing for us to do and that we can't tell it on an individual institutional level. So you're at Harvard. Harvard is known to be the greatest institution, the greatest educational institution, but that's wonderful unless people don't want to live here. Our weather sucks. You know, what do we, what do, what story do we need to tell? And there was also, you know, this, this sort of feeling that you can go to school at Stanford, right? And when you make the decision, when you're 17 years old, you go to Stanford, you create an app that delivers pizza faster, and you retire, and you become a libertarian at 25, and that's, <laughs> And move to New Zealand. And then move to New yeah. Zealand. But there's this mythology around, around regions and what's possible there when there's incredible things happening in this city. And so it was this feeling that collectively we need to do a better job of telling that story so that you in this room can recruit the best people to come and who want to live here and be part of that energy and part of that magic. And so what was, what's unique about Hub Week is that it's a true collaboration. It's a nonprofit. It's Harvard, it's MIT, it's Mass General Hospital, and it's the Boston Globe. And we all said, okay, we're gonna put our time, our resources, and our treasure into creating this thing that's larger, that serves the city. And we created it, and then we opened our arms and said, join us. And we had companies across the city and institutions and organizations join us as well. And it's, um, it has done a lot in five years, and there's this sort of really good understanding within the organization in terms of what we're trying to do. And we need to get now to that next level of doing a better job of, of telling that story beyond 
um, and internationally yeah. in terms of who Boston is. So implicit in this, as I hear you speaking, is that Boston somehow is punching under its weight. I think Boston punches over its weight, but it just ah. doesn't tell. It's, so, it's almost like we're so busy doing and producing and, and innovating that we don't take the time to explain what's happening here. And there is something really remarkable happening here in terms of the hard things that we're doing within our, within our institutions, within our educational institutions, within our companies, with the companies that you have here. And, um, and it's important. It's important for us to take that time and tell that story. And almost every organization does a terrible job telling its own story. Um, and we as a region need to collectively, through a chorus, tell, talk about what we're doing again with the goal of this is important for, to, in order to continue to keep doing the important things. There's something, it, it is a, I really, in my heart, believe that this is a very special place in the world and that there's so much that we're doing that help, you know, the ideas and innovations that we have here, we export everywhere. So it's something that's worth fighting for. Are there, are there initiatives that other cities are doing that you're envious of, where they're somehow getting a certain message out <coughs> more effectively? There's a power in convening and shaping the narrative of a region. And so um, I unfortunately spent a lot of time in Florida and uh, not in Miami, but really close to it. And Miami has been convening around art and around food and wine. And that city now identifies itself as an art city, a food city, and a wine city. And there's something, there's this, it, it, it sort of manifests itself throughout the city and, and the restaurants that open and the institutions that are there and the design centers and whatnot. South by Southwest, Austin, Texas convenes around um, independent film mm -hmm. and music and technology and that's what permeates the city because you're convening around that. Those are the people that you're attracting. And so the idea that we convene around art, science and technology because really that is the intersection of where the future is, that's the next wave of the digital revolution. It's not just what technology can do, it's technology combined with the art and science, with the design, with the biometrics. Do I have a water? No. Um. Um, uh, that's really where the, the next wave of innovation is happening. And so let's convene and bring these people in and, and support them and empower them. Yep. Um, I know you're, you're, you're a convener of uh, sort of women's groups, yes. women's empowerment groups, and um, I'd love to hear you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about, you know, what, what are, sort of an HBR question, but. Oh, thank you so much, <laughs> thank you. You know, what are, um, I'm okay. we, we can share. Okay. <laughs> what, are, what, are, what are companies getting right? What are companies not getting right in terms of understanding how to hire, <coughs> retain, and get the most out of, um, you know, a, a diverse workforce? Um, I think the people here would probably be better at answering that than, than I would be. But what I will say is I was interviewing uh, Brad Stevens, and he said it really well. He said, culture is a shark. It's constantly moving. And you may think you have your culture in your organization solved and fit, but it just, it keeps going. And so one of the things that we realized, um, not realized, but one of the things that became very important at the Globe was that we have um, an equal number of very qualified women managers and very qualified male managers. And that's a, that was just an important aspect of, uh, you know, again, it can't be that somebody is promoted based on something other than their qualifications. But being aware of that, not having quotas, not having, but just making sure that there is, that you're aware of it and you're really actively recruiting and mentoring and keeping underrepresented, any, any underrepresented group so that it creates a culture that isn't, um, you know, that isn't uncomfortable, that's, that's just sort of normal and um, balanced. Mm -hmm. What's your, what do you like as a manager? What's your management style? What's my man? I would say I'm fairly direct um, in that if I, um, I'm not really good at working around uh, that if I sort of feel like something needs to be going in a certain way, I like to just say it and I appreciate when people are direct with me. We, um, I work for um, a bit, I used to work more with Liverpool, I work less with Liverpool now and 
<clears throat> excuse me, there is a, there is a communication. We had a language barrier where I would be very direct and they would say yes to me and I thought that it meant yes. And what they were really saying was no way in hell and I didn't understand that. So I didn't, I didn't work well with that yeah. uh, communication difference. Yeah. Um, so I, we need to wrap up in a second, but um, I guess, it, well, let me reflect a little <coughs> bit on, on the sort of Boston and the challenge sort of the challenge for me. So, I mean, Boston used to be a much more of a media city than it was. The Atlantic yep. was here, and Fast Company, and Inc., and, you know, they all moved to either New York or Washington. Um, I, you know, I had a point where, for Harvard Business Review, I was hiring a creative director, a great job, uh, and finding that people <coughs> would rather stay in New York unemployed than to come here and take this job. And it's partly the weather, it's partly the whatever, but it's, it's you know, th that ecosystem was sort of missing. And it, you know, it made me think that you can, you can talk about Boston being great, but it, it is almost an ecosystem by ecosystem sort of problem. So we're trying to deal with it, you know, having kind of journalistic get-togethers and events and just create a kind of esprit um, so that that will help sort of, sort of hire people. But uh, I, would, I would, if I could brag about what you've accomplished oh for, yeah, for a minute. Oh, yeah, definitely can. Uh, what's fun about Suddenly this? Suddenly we do have more time. We do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is that you are running one of the most enviable media companies in terms of, of success. And you and I share a philosophy is that you have content worth charging mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. And if you are producing content worth charging for, then you need to charge for it. And Harvard Business Review, if you've shopped at your bit at your Hudson News at your local um, airport, you've seen that it's $20 for, um, which is more expensive than a book. I was going to say only $20. <laughs> okay. It's only $20 yeah. <laughs> for this much, but it's, it's worthwhile content. Um, and you're, you've really created a business model that is work, that's working. You're creating communities. There are, you know, HBR study groups that get together in different cities mm -hmm. to talk about the cases. And so if you could talk to us about what your philosophy is and how you've made it work for media, um, made this media company, this small niche media company, so successful. Yeah. Wow. Okay. You turned the tables. Um. We, but we're, you're, you're, you have two media people on stage who both actually really we want to hear media. We both rather be asking <laughs> the questions rather than answering them. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, look, the internet did us all a great disservice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure people, w when I said that offer that the Boston Globe offered me, yep. 26 weeks for a dollar, I'm so sure some people were like, screw that, I'm not going to pay a dollar. I mean, just this, this idea that yeah. we're not going to pay is, so, so at a certain point, you just have to, <laughs> you just have to tighten up the wall. You absolutely have to, you have to create content that's compelling. Um, you know, we're, we are, um, wh where we are now is that for years we published ideas and people, I mean, they're, they're, I, I don't know the people in this room, there's some people who love Harvard Business Review, there's some people who wouldn't read it in a million years, there's CEOs who love it, there's CEOs who seriously wouldn't read it if you put a gun to their head. It's just people learn in different ways, but the people who are engaged are really engaged. And you know, you realize, I, I was at Time Magazine, we had four million subscribers, I never met them, they weren't, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if they knew that they got Time instead of Newsweek, it wasn't a kind of passionate, we have this reader base that is passionate, that knows our archive better than I do. And you know, at a certain point, it is, you need to learn all the kind of new skills, digital, new platforms. We have a whole, you know, like you, we have a whole podcast network now to reach people in different ways. But at the end of the, the day, you know, you've gotta, you've gotta respect the reader with really high quality stuff they can't get elsewhere. And there's no substitute for that. And if that doesn't work, maybe you don't have a business model. I mean, that, that has to be the, the basic. But you have to be super nimble. And, and you know, we redefined quality from long to being long and short and digital and video and podcasts and all that. And people went along for the ride. You know, they, they realized we weren't dumbing it down. We were just atomizing it, breaking it up in, in different ways. So you, you, you know, again, it's, it's sort of you're, you're part of this institution that's been going for for a long time, but you have done a great job. You call it atomizing. I call it meeting readers where they are. Mm -hmm. You know, by saying, you know what, you're on Instagram, and your Instagram yeah. account is huge, and it's really popular. Yeah. And you sort of, you tease these issues, but not in a way that 
I don't still have to subscribe. Yeah. You know, it's 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 sort of different. Um, you're you're really engaging and continuing to change your company to con to find new audiences. Yeah. But so you do Instagram and you get a following. You can't make any money on that. None. Zero. You do. You do sna we went on <laughs> Snapchat, which is as ridiculous as it sounds. We will never make money on that. But you have to be there. Y you can't yes. not be there. But that means you really have to double down on where you can make money, where people are, are happy to hand you over money because you're giving them something that's, that's truly valuable to them. It's sort of this branding, yeah. right? It's, it's this branding. And now, when you talked about this ecosystem, it's something that, that I completely understand what you're saying, is, is that people are afraid to move to a one paper town or yeah. to, you know, if, if there aren't a lot of other places yeah. where they can go from a media perspective. And I'm sure that some of you have this, if you're the only one in your, in your industry. So that's where having friendly competitors can help. I know that you have the great advantage of not having to pay for your content, but how do you um, uh, how do you deal with that? How do you continue to bring in top talent to? Well, work we're on this? we're fortunate in that uh, we used to pay a token amount of money to people to be published, and it was it was honestly more of a hassle for us and for it sounds bad, but for authors because it was you know, it was a somewhat nominal sum, and that wasn't the value. The val value was that you published at HBR, which honestly would translate into higher speaker fees, yep. consulting gigs, so that whatever money, even if it was good money, would, would sort of pale compared to that. Anyway, we are actually out of time, um, but, but maybe sort of a final word for people out here who maybe are connecting with the idea of, yeah, I love Boston, I'd love to do what I can to you know, help make this you know, more, or, or for people to realize that we're punching above our weight and a lot of great things. Any sort of last words for I th people here? I think that the new way of doing things is collaboration. Yep. And collaborating with not only within your company, but outside of your company, and finding a fellow media organization that you can collaborate with, finding somebody in a completely different industry that we can do more with. And uh, we do have a lot of the same goals, even though we might be competing in some areas. But um, collectively doing more uh, is what I would say. Okay, great. It's the most successful. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda Henry. Abby Pinter, thank you. <laughs>